we're going to talk about artificial intelligence and radiology, and the title of my talk is Rise of the Machines. So I want you to think about a quote. Uh, who might have said this first? There is no function the computer cannot do in radiology. Was it Elon Musk, Jeffrey Hinton, Dr. G. Lodwick, or Rusty Hoffman? Now, I'm contractually obligated to say it was Rusty, but in fact it was Dr. G. Lodwick. He was a radiologist in the 1950s, and he worked on a computer algorithm that he thought could accurately identify abnormalities in chest x-rays. And he went on for about three decades to work on this problem, eventually receiving the Nobel Prize nomination in 1975, but he never achieved his goal. A few years later, a psychologist named Frank Rosenblatt uh, came uh, to, into a lot of attention for a computer that he invented that he said would be able to talk, write, think, and be conscious of its own existence. In fact, he was one of the first to use uh, his knowledge of the brain to map out what is essentially the earliest artificial neural network that's ever been discovered. Unfortunately, his computer didn't work, and it was pretty soon that before he faded from public view and all of these guys kind of uh, went into obscurity. And this is the reason why. This is a five megabyte hard drive being shipped by IBM in 1955, right? <laughs> so imagine with all these great ideas and all, this, all these powerful ideas, he, they just couldn't uh, do what they knew was possible because they didn't have the technical hardware. Times have changed. We now have powerful neural nets. We have powerful GPUs. And they can do a lot of things. They run a lot of our lives, social networking, what you buy on Amazon, your banking. Um, but they're also really, really good at classifying images. And this is a screenshot from something called ImageNet, which is uh, something that Fei Fei Li from Stanford started. It's a, it's a repository online of over 14 million images that are uh, char uh, carefully characterized. And this is just an example from the spider page. But every year, neural network scientists get together and they work on who can um, diagnose or who can classify these images the best. And you can see every year the error rate goes down and down to the point where now the, um, the, uh, the performance exceeds human, human ability. So now we're really good at telling the difference between parrots and guacamole and uh, blueberry muffins and chihuahuas. But the question that we probably should be asking ourselves is can we use this for something a little bit more impactful? Can we be using this for medical imaging? And you can think that from a conceptual perspective, it's not hard to imagine that you can take any random image, like a man in a black shirt is playing guitar, and you can upload that, and a computer can come up with an automatic caption for that. The same thing should be possible for medical imaging. You should be able to upload an image and have it return a caption. Why would we want to do this? Well, it turns out that there's a lot of human error in diagnostic radiology. Um, but for me, the most important reason is that most of the world doesn't have any access to radiology at all. And they're dying of things like TB and lung cancer, and yet they don't have even a basic chest radiologist to look at their x-rays. So um, about a year and a half ago, this is Professor Hinton. He's a famous uh, uh, computer scientist. And he went to a hospital and gave this talk. I hope you guys can play that audio. Um. People should stop training radiologists now. It's just completely obvious that within five years, um, deep learning is going to do better than radiologists because it's going to be able to get a lot more experience. Um, it might be 10 years, but we've got plenty of radiologists already. Um, so he said this, and people freaked out. Um, there's a lot of articles that came out um, in big journals, and a lot of opinion pieces were written. Still, people are writing a lot of opinion pieces about this. And then we did some work with Andrew Eng and, uh, right before our SNA last year, and then he tweeted this out just to fan the flames. I was just like, please don't do this, and he tweeted out. So now we have lots of people really concerned that diagnostic radiology is in trouble. I'm just waiting for the next tweet from Kim Kardashian to tell us that now we're all in trouble, <laughs> and this new hashtag will start trending, and, and we're, we're, out of, we're out of jobs. <laughs> but before we get too carried away, we have to uh, think about reality. And this picture of an overturned self-driving car, and this headline you may have seen just from a few days ago, reminds us that while PR is great and it's really fun to talk about the hype, reality is a whole different story. So first of all, medical images are really large and complicated. I don't have to tell you that, but I do have to tell the computer scientists that. There are hundreds of thousands of times larger than the traditional imaging analysis tasks. And for the most part, um, this thumbnail of a kitten is a great example of the fact that most of the pixels in that image will tell you that there's a kitten there. Um, and so that classification task is not very difficult. But most of the pixels in that chest x-ray of a healthy person who happens to have lung cancer tell you that that person's healthy. So it's only a small proportion of that image that's actually letting you know that that's the important finding that you need to classify. And so this is a big challenge for computer scientists. Another thing that comes up is uh, having the right context. So these are two brain MRs from pediatric patients. One is completely normal, and one has a severe neurologic disease. They're, for all intents and purposes, identical. This is Polizius-Merzbacher disease, which is a de delay in myelination. The only difference is one is three months old, 
and one is three years old. If you don't have that context, your model can describe the wrong labels and lead to disastrous consequences. This is one of my favorite things. So these models actually do really well, as I, as I showed you. In fact, this is a model that, uh, with video, can identify many common objects around your house with high degrees of confidence. And that bar indicates the amount of confidence. So there's a banana in the image. You can see that it knows it's a banana. It also may think it could be a slug, but probably not very confident that's a slug. It's probably a banana. However, all you have to do is place an artifact, known as a token, in the image, and it completely screws up the model. Now it's really confident that's a toaster. That's not really right. So um, the same thing can happen in medical imaging, right? So we deal with artifacts every day because we're humans and we know how to deal with context. Yes, that's a coil uh, and that's streak artifact. Yes, that's motion artifact. That's a ring artifact. We can deal with that because we do it every day. Um, but if these things lead to a model making a, diff a wrong diagnosis with high degrees of confidence, we can find ourselves in some trouble. The biggest, the biggest challenge I think we've had uh, in our lab is uh, dis the discussion around ground truth. Um, it's really difficult for engineers, many of you may be engineers, to understand the concept that there is gray area, there's no black and white in a lot of medical diagnostics. What is this abnormality in the right lung? Well, it, is it a finding? Is it a diagnosis? Well, any of these could potentially apply, and there's probably more, um, and it's difficult to explain that we don't always know the answer. So when we're training these models and building these machines, we don't always know the ground truth, and that's, that's difficult. All right, so let's talk about some research that we're doing. We started a center late last year called Amy Artificial Intelligence and Medi Medical Imaging. Um, Rusty Hoffman's a member of this group. Kurt, Kurt Langlotz is one of the founders. Um, and we kind of have a fairly simple uh, strategy. We have teams that we put together consisting of clinicians, statisticians, and computer scientists. Once in a while, we'll partner with industry. And we uh, leverage our database of 5.5 million exams for a lot of our work. But what we have that no other institution in the world has, and we're very proud of this, we have 1.5 million exams that were prospectively labeled by the interpreting radiologists uh, in the actual act of interpreting. So what that means is that we have really good labels. And we have an archive of really good labels. And that sets us apart from those groups that are having to go back and retrospectively label their exams. Finally, we're clinicians. We want to get these out in the clinic. We want to see what difference they make. We want to try them out. So we have a clinical evaluation pipeline. Uh, and we've already got our first model in, in practice now. And this is our first model. So uh, a lot of the initial founders of this group are pediatric radiologists. And um, one of the things we hate the most, besides scoliosis films, are bone age films. We hate having to do this. It's very it's repetitive, skilled human labor, essentially. You have to go back to a book. You have to compare it to other children's hands and determine what age this child is. And so we put a model together with a group of computer scientists about a year and a half ago. And lo and behold, in about two weeks, this model did better than any of our radiologists in the section. This figure is from our paper. and. Um, so those are x-rays, and there's this overlaid map. And uh, the areas that are red and yellow indicate the pixels that the model found that were important to make the decision. And you can see that, for those of you who remember your radiology training in PEDS, uh, it's looking at the proximal carpal row. It's looking at some of, the, um, some of the first and second ray. And that's exactly where we tell our residents to look when they're learning how to do bone age. So it's really interesting. They, it learned this organically. This was not uh, directed by any of the researchers. The other thing we did is we said, well, we have these other uh, reports, uh, millions and millions of reports, that don't necessarily have a structured label, and they're made up of free text. Can we teach one of these models to read the report for us and pull out the relevant labels so we can have better labels at scale? And so we did this with uh, pulmonary embolism CT reports, and we're able to tell you not only is there a pulmonary embolism in there, how old is it, and is it subsegmental or not? Um, and, and this is the work I referred to earlier. This is the work we did with Andrew Eng's group on the pneumonia task, where we compared four radiologists to our model, and, um, and we had them read 400 x-rays. Um, and it turned out that the model did better, consistently better, than our radiologists. We went a step further. We took 12 radiologists from around the country at several institutions, and we had them label that same test set for effusion, and it did just as well as the expert radiologists. We did it for nodules, did just as well as the radiologists. And we did it for edema, and we did it for 10 more labels. Uh, the interesting thing about this work is that all of our experts, and some of them are chest radiologists, it took them about three and a half, four hours to do this test set of around 400 or so chest x-rays. Took our model one minute. And if we can do that, again, with very minimal work in such a short amount of time, you can imagine the possibilities. But we're not stopping there. We're doing all kinds of other things. And here's just some previews of that. So we're detecting fractures automatically. We're detecting PE automatically. We're determining congenital abnormalities in pediatric neuroimaging automatically. 
Um, we're now looking at DVT, which is notoriously a difficult um, problem because ultrasound is so operator dependent, but now we're able to do that relatively well. And even advanced MSK imaging we're able to do to accuracy levels meeting or exceeding that of practicing radiologists. So we're really excited to be presenting this work and hopefully next year I'll be able to show you more of these results. But we're also doing some space age things, which I really am excited about. So this is a project where we're asking a model to look at the non-contrast image and predict what would that image have looked like had we given that patient contrast. And the reason we can do that is we have lots and lots and lots of pre and post con, right? Uh, images in our archives. So we just keep showing the model, here's what it looked like before contrast, and I want you to output the post-contrast image as the, as the label. And we're already getting some exciting results in neuro. This is some of the work we're trying to do with, with liver. Um, and it would be nice to never have to give contrast again. Is it possible? I'm not sure, but we're going to try. Another interesting project is there's no reason why these computer models have to look at the same image as we do. Uh, in fact, we lose a lot of data when we turn a sinogram into an interpretable image. Why not just look at the sinogram to begin with, labeling it with the output, and seeing whether our models have better performance, and we're doing just that. The other thing that we're using is also uh, exploring case space. It's a little trickier and certainly not my cup of tea, but it's something that we're working on as well. But we're not the only ones. I don't mean to say that Stanford's the only place doing this work. In fact, I don't know of any place that's not doing this work. Um, and I can certainly say that you're going to see many, many more companies this year at RSNA even than last year. Um, these are just some examples from different groups uh, in, in industry. All right, so let's talk about the future, which is why we're all here. This is exciting stuff. Let's, let's talk about what's going to happen. All right, so number one, all of these projects, no matter which of them you're looking at or if you're trying to do one on your own, you need lots and lots and lots of accurately labeled data. Data is the new oil. That is, there's no better uh, tagline for this uh, current revolution. And these are your new visitors in your hospital. These guys <laughs> are going to show up. And they're going to be asking for your data. They're going to be willing to give you money. But they're going to want to have exclusive contracts with your hospital administrators. And if you're not prepared to deal with what they're prepared to offer, you might find yourself locking your data up and preventing you from doing your own research. But there's more to these projects than just looking at the interpretation task. There's also AI opportunities in order decision making, performing the imaging exam itself, processing the image, and even coding and billing. These are all tasks in our enterprise that require repetitive, skilled human labor. Therefore, they can all be replaced, potentially, with an AI model. And there are companies looking to each and every part of this. And they're not small companies. These are the largest companies in the world. And they're all interested in doing this work right now. Here's just some startups. I grabbed you know, a half dozen or so. There's, there's many, many more out there. And, you'll see, and again, you'll see some more this year at RSNA. But I, I wanted to walk through a few scenarios because that, the point of this is to say what's going to happen to your colleagues in 10 years. So I'm going to give you a few scenarios and we'll walk through them. So number one, straight off the bat, maybe AI just walks in and just completely replaces radiologists. It's possible. It's possible it'd be like a lab test. You just kind of send your patient down and you know, print out comes out and you're done. Uh, it might look something like this. I don't think it's realistic. But I just wanted to illustrate what could happen if this scenario plays out. Not likely. All right. So let's go on to something else. Let's say the AI lowers the bar to perform the diagnostic part of imaging so low that even someone like a cardiologist, here shown as a devil-like figure, could potentially do a radiologist's job. Is it possible? It's certainly possible. In that scenario, you can imagine that radiology jobs could be eliminated. I, I mean, I'm just putting it out there. I want, you wanted blood? I got you some blood. All right. So but here's another scenario that I think might be slightly more likely. Um, radiologists become so incredibly efficient with these new tools that they're able to handle a lot of the workflow. And these big mega groups will start continuing to, to sort of eliminate jobs. And it's possible that a really savvy AI could partner with an AI and eliminate jobs. There you go. All right. A lot of work, actually, to do that. I'm glad you enjoyed that. All right. So, um, but here's my favorite scenario, and the, and the thing that we're working on the most is we really want to take these AI tools. Now, I know there's going to be a lot of market forces at play, but we're planning on releasing every model we build for free. And because when there's no one sitting in that chair doing the diagnostic work, there's a lot of people that don't have any access to the proper health care. And, and, you know, so that, for me, is the reason why these AI tools are so exciting. And if you can provide diagnostic services to people, again, that don't have the access, I think you can do, uh, do a lot of good. And so this is a beta of something that we're going to put out there very soon. So we're testing our algorithms uh, clinically first. But then we plan to release them for the world to use for free. You can take a picture with your smartphone and upload it. You can just upload it on the web. Um, and it will return whatever labels that we've programmed our models to recognize. And it'll give you a level of confidence. That's that bar on the right. Um, and again, it takes about 0.3 milliseconds for an x-ray to be read. 
But we also want to do something for the research community. So you, you remember I talked earlier about the, the idea of ImageNet, which is this huge repository of classified images. Well, we want to do the same thing with medical images, because it's really not fair that these companies are coming into your hospital, locking down your data and preventing the rest of us from, from you know, profiting from this or learning from this. So we plan on putting a free uh, medical image net out there where uh, highly classified uh, or uh, well classified labeled data is out there for, for uh, research use from around the world because we do find that uh, when this data is out there for free, the best models come from places you wouldn't expect. All right, some, some key points as I wrap up here. So medical imaging definitely has potential for disruption. There are significant challenges, as I mentioned, in application. But I think the greatest areas of impact are going to be in clinician-centered imaging tools and global applications. And thank you for your time.